The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hi, everyone. My name is Kim Trenbath, and welcome to the Better Buildings Alliance Plug and Process Loads Technology Team Webinar. Um, again, I'm Kim Trenbath. I'm from the National Renewable Energy Laboratory in Golden, Colorado, and I'm pleased um, that everyone is joining us today. Hope everyone is staying safe and best wishes to you and your family um, despite the pandemic. Um, since we're going virtual, we're showing the speakers um, in video. So now you can see me <laughs> at home. Um, and so let's just go ahead and get started. Next slide. All right, today we have a great lineup of presentations. Um, first, I will be talking a little bit about the PPL team. Um, giving some updates on upcoming events. And then we have two great um, technical presentations on controlled receptacles. The first one will be presented by Harold Jepson from Legrand, and the second will be a joint presentation by Kelly Cunningham from Pacific Gas and Electric and Melissa Lee from Energy Solutions. Um, after that, we'll have some Q&A, and if we have time, I would love to have some member updates. So um, if you have a question at any time during the webinar, please type your question into the chat box. Um, it could be for any of the speakers, and we will answer them during the Q&A session. If we don't get to all of the questions, we will send out the responses to the questions at the end of the webinar. And then also, if you have a member update on something that you are doing in your organization to control plug loads, please feel free to provide that um, during the member update. And to do that, raise your hand or you can type in the, into the chat box that you would like to provide a member update. And if we have time, we will open up the floor to the members who have raised their hands. Next slide. A little bit about us. So the first um, person there is me. I'm Kim Trenbath. And the leadership team is from the National Renewable Energy Laboratory and from Waypoint Energy. I have my colleagues with me here, um, Bennett Doherty and Amy Labar, who are both um, engineers in the Commercial Buildings Research Group, and then also Katie Vrabel and Carly Burke from Waypoint Energy. Next slide. I'm pleased to introduce a new member to our team. Um, she is Robin Tuttle, and she is a project controller with the National Renewable Energy Laboratory. She's also in the Commercial Buildings Research Group. Robin worked at Boston, Global, Gov Boston Government Services before coming to NREL, where she provided the U.S. Department of Energy Building Technologies Office specialized project support in funding opportunity announcement coordination, contract negotiation, and project control. She is a lead green associate and a certified project management professional. So we're pleased to have Robin on the team, and you may be hearing from her um, throughout the next months or years. Next. Next, please. Next slide. So we have several resources on PPLs available to you through our website. And examples include how-to guidance on assessing and reducing PPLs in your buildings and lists of PPL-related utility incentives. And you can see these highlighted on this slide. Both are accessible through hyperlinks on this slide deck, which will be sent out after the presentation. Next slide, please. So our team is currently working on the following publication. Um, it is a paper that will be published in ACEEE 2020 Summer Study on Energy Efficiency in, building in Buildings Conference Proceedings. And this paper, um, we just, in this paper, we describe emerging technologies for plug load management systems, specifically technologies that learn the occupant behavior and adjust controls accordingly, as well as technologies that allow for better plug load management through automatic and dynamic load detection, which the acronym is ADLD. ADLD allows for seamless plug load management no matter where the load is located. This paper will be helpful for you because it displays some of the um, technologies that will be seen in some of the plug load management systems of the future. Next slide, please. So 
So our team is collaborating with the Integrated Lighting Campaign, or the ILC, which is led by the Pacific Northwest National Laboratory. And we are pleased to announce that the ILC will be launched this summer. The ILC is a recognition and guidance program designed to help facility owners and managers take advantage of savings opportunities from high efficiency interior lighting solutions. These solutions could include integrating lighting with plug loads and HVAC control. So if you know of a project or building with this integration, please reach out to Felipe Leone at integratedlighting at pnl.gov. We would be great, it would be great to hear from you because we are looking for these projects. Next slide. I'm pleased to highlight a couple upcoming events, and the big one is the 2020 Better Building Summit. Now, this summit um, used to be in person, but now it's moved to a virtual summit. And during this virtual summit, we'll have webinars and peer exchanges. And this is a great opportunity for you because it's free to anybody who would like to register. Um, so please register and join all the conversation. The, um, the registration information can be found at the hyperlink on the slide. And again, I'll be sending out the slide after the presentation. Next. And then another upcoming event is our next PPL team call, which will be over the summer of 2020. And in this call, we will be highlighting um, in the state of Oregon, and we'll have two presenters from Oregon, David Wartman, who's the statewide sustainability officer, and Stephanie Cruz, who is a facilities engineer with the Oregon Department of Energy. And they will be talking about how they implemented a statewide plug load strategy um, in Oregon. I will have the registration information soon and I will be sending that out to the listserv. Next slide. Okay, great. So now we're gonna to get to the um, cool part of the presentation where we are um, going through the technical presentations. I'm pleased to um, introduce our first presenter um, who is Harold Jepson. Harold is the Vice President of Standards and Industry Affairs for Legrand's Controls and Lighting Divisions. He is a 25-year veteran in the energy, lighting, and building automation industry. He is a licensed electrical engineer, contractor, and member of ICC, AEE, IES, ASHRAE, WELL, and the NFPA. He is an Energy Efficiency Code Compliance Specialist, serving on the ASHRAE 90.1 Lighting sub Subcommittee and active in ICC and California's Title 24 Energy Code Development. He is the technical lead for Legrand's Code Solutions Program and is a regular presenter on energy code topics. I'm pleased to turn the presentation over to Harold. Thanks, Kim. Uh, nice to be able to be invited and to be able to present. You know, as, as we've documented over the years, the the load profile in commercial buildings continues to go down due to the new and more efficient technologies and the energy efficiency codes raising the standards for how buildings are built efficiently. However, the MELS category is projected to increase. It's the only area that's projected to increase by a percentage of overall energy use inside of a building. And a solution to this growing energy use segment is what I'll address in receptacle controls. Go ahead, next slide. So we often have many names for uh, receptacle controls that may be referred to as automatic receptacle controls, controlled receptacles, uh, plug load controls we often hear as well. But in the end, it's all trying to do the same thing. And that's provide an automatic means to turn off power to receptacle plugs for the main purpose of stopping plug load energy use when it's not needed inside of a space. So if you went into a space that utilizes this technology, what, what might we observe? Next slide. We'd probably see uh, in the wall, duplex plugs or plugs which are marked as controlled receptacles with a symbol and controlled written on them. Here's an example on the left side of one with a button. This is actually a wirelessly controlled receptacle for shutting off power. Next slide. We also might see um, plug load timer receptacles that have time switches integrated into them. And also considered as plug load control is controllable plug strips. However, next slide please. 
even though this device is rather nifty, um, it's not compliant with the codes, which we'll talk to when we talk about the code requirements here in a minute. Other devices that we may see inside or observe inside of a space, next slide, would be occupancy sensors mounted up in the ceiling or a time switch, or also wall switches that can be used to turn plug loads on and off or to override them after hours. These are also oftentimes dual purpose and operate the lighting system as well um, at the same time. Additionally, next slide. There may be some hidden devices such as distributed room controllers, which are doing the plug load power control themselves, as well as back in electrical rooms, a centralized panel, which has relays or contactors um, that are making and breaking power out to the loads in the circuits. So what are we trying to do with all this equipment inside the building? Well, um, we're trying to control loads that don't need to be left on when people are not there. Go ahead, next slide. These could be displays and monitors, tasked and exam lights, space heaters, fans, and other electrical loads that only need to be on when occupants are, are there inside that space. On the right side, you'll see a quick guide that may be left on um, in, inside of an office or on a desk that indicates what devices are to be controlled and other devices that should not be controlled and where to properly plug them into a receptacle as an example. So just how effective are these controls? Next slide, please. You know, over the last 10 years, there's been a number of control receptacle plug load studies um, that have to, to, to understand the opportunity of the energy that can be saved with these. You can see that it, it, on some of these studies here, it can range anywhere based on how it's deployed from 19 to 32% savings. Um, in the center, you actually see what is the case report that California utilized and was produced by the utilities. Um, that brought it and substantiated its use inside California's Title 24 energy code. Next slide. Other research that's out there have been done by states and also local utilities, as you can see here. And on the far right is an article that was put into the High Performance Building magazine on a, a US courthouse that was inside Los Angeles, which modeled a 25% energy savings as part of the building design using receptacle um, controls. So where are receptacle controls implemented in commercial energy efficiency building codes? Next slide. ASHRAE 90.1 was the first in the energy codes to introduce receptacle control in their uh, 2010 version of the code. Also, Title 24 adopted it in their 2013 version of the code. Um, Washington State Energy Code has had it as part of their code since 2015. And more recently, and through the, the three-year update cycle of the IECC code, the 2021 code has also adopted um, receptacle control inside its code. And that's due to be published later this year. So what does that mean for compliance throughout the United States? Next slide. This is a map that shows generally throughout the United States where codes and standards um, have applied receptacle control. Those states that are marked in green currently have in place and have adopted an energy code um, where automatic receptacle control is, is a requirement inside commercial buildings. States highlighted in yellow are states that um, have a alternate path of code compliance. That's typically the ASHRAE 90.1 path that's available to them that if they were to follow the alternative path um, for, for any certain reason, that they then would be compliant or be utilizing receptacle controls. There are a few states, those highlighted in red, which have adopted a code that has receptacle control as part of its provisions, yet um, they've chosen to make it optional in their state or have created an amendment uh, that, that, that it's not required to be used. Those states that are the lighter color, gray or off-white, those are states that are home rule states where individual jurisdictions will decide, you know, what, what code requirements that they'll follow. And, and we, I, don't, I don't have good data on uh, in, in those individual jurisdictions. But gray states are states that do not have a receptacle control requirement as part of their, um, in, inside their codes, largely because they're on an older version of code prior to the receptacle controls coming into play. So what specific requirements are there for receptacle controls? Next slide. 
So I'll speak more specifically to the requirements that will be inside the 2021 IECC. Most of the codes generally have the same terminology in them and are asking the same thing. There may be some small nuances to them. First of all is that receptacle controls are not deployed in all spaces in a building. Um, it, the, the code dictates those spaces or areas where it should be deployed. Here you can see it's private offices, conference rooms, copy and print rooms. And then also you see that in open office areas, it's in individual workstations and modular partitions and office workstation systems, mostly places where people are doing work, they have, they have plug loads that are being plugged in or they're being utilized inside that space. So what are exactly the requirements that the code is asking us to follow? Next slide. That is, a, the requirements are to control at least 50% of all the receptacles in those specific spaces. Um, and if, in, if it is in modular furniture and that modular furniture is not shown on the plans, which is often typical in an open office set of construction documents, it is that the feeders that are, that are engineered for that space, that 25% of them would be installed um, for receptacle control that they would have control as part of them. So when the modular furniture or partitions are added to that space, that that'll be capable and ready for, for receptacle control use. Another requirement, and this is uh, inside the 2021 code and it varies between the codes, is uniformity of controlled versus uncontrolled receptacles. And this is to avoid uh, any issues with um, um, uh, plug loads, excessive use of plug strips, I should say, um, or extension cords inside the space. Essentially what it indicates is that when you have a controlled receptacle, it must be located within 12 inches of an uncontrolled receptacle. In the case of modular furniture and because of the structure of modular furniture and the busway between it, that's relaxed to 72 inches, which is more meaningful for that, for that type of, um, for that equipment. Next slide. And then the last main requirement is the marking of the receptacles. And so uh, the National Electric Code dictates, oh, one more click there. I think I've got an animation there. Uh, in the National Electric Code, it actually uh, dictates what should be marked on the receptacles that are controlled. So a standard receptacle that has power all the time and is uncontrolled is not marked, but a controlled receptacle would have the words controlled on it and have a power symbol on it. Next slide. So what, what is the function that's required by the code? Well, there's three options in how we can operate receptacle controls. First, it can be operated by a scheduled basis or a time switch um, where it can shut off the lights when a building is intended to be vacant and no one is inside the certain spaces. That area of control by the code is limited to a 5,000 foot maximum control area or one floor, whichever is less. And when we're using time-based control, we need some method to override it back on in case someone is there after hours and after the plug loads or receptacle controls have been shut off. A second method would be used, and this is probably the most common, is used by occupancy sensors, that they would detect people inside the space, and then when people are no longer there within 20 minutes would, would shut off the controlled receptacles. And lastly would be an automated signal from some other system. This could be a, a card key system, maybe an alarm system or a building automation system that would do likewise and shut off the receptacle controls within 20 minutes of the space being vacated. Also, and like I mentioned before, what's not allowed is the use of plug-in devices like a controllable plug strip. And this is because they are not permanently installed and they could be removed later after the, you know, at some time later and can't guarantee operation. So there are some exceptions to this code requirement. Next slide. And that is areas where you've got equipment that needs to operate uh, 24 hours. Um, and also there is an exception for uh, when automatic receptacle control might endanger occupant safety or security. So those are your two exceptions. So what exactly does it look like in practice? Next slide. I'll show an example here of a small office, private office deployment of receptacle controls, and then also for classroom, which we'll use a wireless control for the private office and wired for the classroom. Next slide. 
in a small private office, as you see here, outlined uh, in the green circles are duplex outlets, which is a common symbol on the construction drawings. With a specific note here that indicates that there is no additional wiring that needs to be made to these receptacles because they are going to wirelessly receive a signal of when to turn on or turn off the controlled receptacle outlet. Next slide. Green arrow here indicates what the wireless receptacle control might look like. And it's receiving a signal from a transmitter, this um, on the right side by the red arrow here that might be mounted up in the ceiling or in a ceiling tile that would transmit to these receptacles. Next slide. What's triggering that transmitter is a room controller. This is actually a controller that's operating the lighting in the room, but has the ability also to signal um, the the also be able to signal the transmitter of to turn the lights on and off or turn on and off the receptacles as well as the lighting when it's no longer needed. This is receiving detection signals from this occupancy sensor wall switch in this particular design that's mounted on the wall. So the sequence of operation here is that as the occupant enters the room, they would they would um, they, the occupancy sensor would detect them and regardless of whether they would turn the lights on or off with the switch, um, the plug loads are going to turn on just based on occupancy in the space. Then after they leave the space and after a time delay that's no greater than 20 minutes, it would then turn off the receptacle controls and thereby all the loads that would be plugged into those, to those uh, receptacles. Next slide, please. We'll take a look at the classroom as an example. It's classroom layout similar. You see the duplex outlets. There's many more inside of a classroom, a larger space. And there's notes here for the installing contractor. In this case, we're not deploying wireless products. We're, this is where we're going to wire two different circuits or two different branch circuits to every duplex outlet. One which is going to be live all the time or hot all the time. That would be our, our uncontrolled outlet. And then the other one would be a branch circuit that would be controlled. Next slide. The controlled circuit would run through a receptacle or plug load controller that's again connected to the lighting system or in conjunction with signals from the lighting system. And you're wiring in more standard receptacles into these outlets, except for the fact that they have markings on them indicating that they're controlled. Um, a small mistake with this graphic here is that this is actually, these are outlets where both outlets would be intended to be controlled. Um, what we're showing here in the classroom and the way the classroom is being designed is really that we would have uh, one of these receptacle outlets would be controlled and the other one would be uncontrolled. So those are available. I just didn't have a picture and put it in here. Next slide. Then what signals this system again is the occupancy sensors inside the space. These are already doing and available typically in the space for doing the shutoff control of the lighting. And again, the sequence of operation is an individual enters the space. Um, the occupancy sensors detect that someone is inside that space. They turn on the controlled receptacles by turning on that, that, that receptacle plug controller, which then provides power to all of those controlled receptacles. So, I mean, I hope that's been helpful in sharing with you the, the what's, why's, and the how's of receptacle control and energy efficiency with, uh, as it comes into play from the codes and standards point of view. So just as a wrap up summary, next slide. That uh, receptacle controls have many names, but in the end are trying to achieve the same thing. And that is to turn off plugged in loads when they're not needed inside of a space or an area. There's a, a number of reports and studies out there that document their energy savings. We're seeing growing adoption and use of them as codes and more progressive codes are being adopted in states and jurisdictions. In the end, what it's trying to do is provide 50% of the receptacles to be controlled and to shut off. And that's where you would plug in loads that don't need to stay on all the time. Um, also, there's many available methods and products. Although I showed two examples, there's many other ways that this could be deployed inside of a space and engineered into a, into a building design. So I think the next question for us is, you know, how are we adapting to these controls? And I've given you kind of a clinical approach, and that is, is what does the code say? Where is it being adopted? And what are some examples of how to do it in a perfect world? 
Kelly, I think, is going to now talk to how are we adapting to it by sharing some field experience. So thank you. Thank you so much, Harold. That was a really helpful um, presentation on how controlled or spectacles work in certain um, building types, and then also an overview of the codes related to the controlled receptacles. Um, next slide. That these, um, well, like Harold said, these um, technologies or these presentations highlight um, technologies, uh, highlight the controlled receptacles. And um, while we highlighted the technology with Harold's presentation, we are going to talk about the application of the technology with Kelly and Marissa's presentation. And so I want to take a moment to introduce um, Kelly and Mar Marissa, our next speakers. Kelly Cunningham currently serves as a program manager on Pacific Gas and Electric's codes and standards team. Her role includes leading the development of energy codes and standards enhancement proposals across all building systems to advance California's energy code. She also leads a program that supports cities pursuing reach codes and supports increasing compliance with the current code. And Marissa Lee is a project manager with Energy Solutions Policy and Ratings Group, where she supports advocacy to enhance building codes and appliance standards. Her work includes research, outreach, and education, and facilitating industry collaboration to advance energy savings policies. I'm now pleased to turn the presentation over to Kelly and Marissa. Thank you so much for the introduction. Um, and uh, she's giving you a little bit of uh, our background. Um, we're here today to uh, present some research findings from a pursuit that we took up at the request of, um, well, persons who work on advancing the energy codes, and they were asking, well, how is this going? How's it going in practice? Uh, and this is an important question that we found we could not identify good data sources uh, to support the answer to. Uh, next slide. So um, our role in this process as a statewide utility codes and standards team focused on the, well, originating from the West Coast, um, uh, comprised of the investor-owned utilities with support from some of our major municipals, uh, is generally to support the Energy Commission, the California Energy Commission, in developing proposed changes to Title 24. But we also are active on the um, national stage because uh, we want all of our model energy codes across the U.S. Uh, to reflect uh, what is uh, supportable in each of the areas in which they are adopted in terms of the best practices for energy savings that are possible for a base code, or in the case of 189 or REACH codes, what's possible uh, for codes that go beyond that base code. So uh, our uh, West Coast Utility Collaborative um, helps also to support national codes and standards advancement where appropriate. And a rising tide um, uh, floats all boats, right? Isn't that the expression? So um, we want to make sure that we look at all these things. Um, and um, controlled receptacles is a piece now, as um, Harold pointed out, of several codes and standards um, across the United States. Next. So Harold already went over the requirements um, with you in terms of which standards include uh, automatic controlled receptacles as a component of what um, builders and uh, installers must do. Um, but it's not necessarily done. Uh, as with all energy codes, each cycle presents an opportunity to true up language, to get it right, uh, where maybe before it was hard to understand or implement, um, and also offers an opportunity to advance and move things forward. For example, uh, in California, um, stakeholders that bring proposals to the Energy Commission uh, include multiple stakeholders, like the California Energy Alliance, which is considering a proposal for the 2022 cycle, which is just starting now, um, to expand existing controlled requirements. So um, as they move this forward, and as we as a collective interested in advancing the energy code, uh, we were really hearing that some stakeholders were saying, um, 
no one's complying with this, or it's difficult to comply with, where others were like, oh, it's, it's going fine. Uh, it's not an issue. Um, so we wanted to dig in and really try to give each of these code bodies some information so that they'd be better informed moving forward. We don't want to make exceptions for things that uh, don't need it. Uh, exceptions create complexity. So what can we do? Move forward. So we decided um, to start a survey, and this is a national survey, not just focusing on the West Coast, um, but we wanted to reach out uh, to gather some of this information about the requirements as they current st currently stand and uh, to see if uh, they could be improved. And this became quite an effort that lasted uh, approximately six months or more to identify as many uh, interviewees as we can and to gather and assess the information and to try and make a determination. Next. So before I turn it over to Marissa, who was the lead researcher on this survey through Energy Solutions, one of our close contracting partners, um, I will just talk a little bit about the uh, bullet points you see here on the screen, um, what we looked at, and what we uh, included is the interview content in our survey. We looked at product availability, how those products are being used in practice, how designers are approaching um, adding these to designs. Uh, we tried to gather information about how occupants were accepting these uh, devices in practice, which turned out to be really hard to identify. Um, also, technical feasibility. If it's too hard to meet or exceed code minimum requirements, do we have the right baseline installed in the code? Um, and any market barriers that might exist to move things forward in the future? Um, so our bottom goal here is energy savings for all of these energy codes. So we also wanted to know um, how, how are things looking? Harold gave you a few examples of uh, case studies on where these were modeled to save quite a bit of energy. Um, was this true? And more importantly, could we find out if it was true? So in the absence of all this information out there in the public sphere, uh, we decided to do some digging. So with the next slide, I'll hand it over to Marissa, uh, who will tell you about our study and the results. Thanks, Kelly. So as, as was mentioned, my name is Marissa Lee. I'm a member of the team from Energy Solutions that supports the statewide codes and standards team. And I led the outreach and data collection effort on this project. In terms of the outreach, it was important for us to get broad geographic representation because ASHRAE is implemented in states across the country. And we wanted perspectives from different groups that were involved in designing a controlled receptacles project. Next slide, please. Uh, we interviewed respondents typically for 45 to 90 minutes, and our goal was to understand what are their struggles with complying with the code currently, um, and are there any changes that would make it easier for them, what are the concerns about the technology. And uh, so when, when you go to install a new technology, you really want to know, can I afford it, can I find it, and am I even going to be able to install it once I get it to the job site. And our respondents overwhelmingly told us, Yes, it does cost a little bit more, but not enough to hold up a project. Um, yes, we can find products that comply. And it may take a little bit more time and effort to coordinate a project with the controlled receptacles, but it's not more difficult to install one than a regular outlet. So it's really not a technical feasibility issue. So that begs the question, if, it's, if cost, uh, product availability, and technical feasibility aren't issues, then why aren't we seeing controlled receptacles in more buildings? Uh, is it possibly because the code language itself is a problem? Next slide, please. The short answer to that question is no. Most of the respondents did not think the code language was unclear or confusing. But when we asked them if you could wave a magic wand and change the language, most of them said that they would. And the thing that they often pointed to was that controlled receptacles are treated differently in different places. So what do I mean by that exactly? Next slide. Uh, as Harold mentioned in his, in his presentation, the code requiring controlled receptacles is not the only building code out there. They're, it's sort of implemented unevenly across the country. Uh, for example, the IECC code currently does not require uh, controlled receptacles. And within ASHRAE, it only requires them in new construction projects. 
So in other words, when multiple building codes apply uh, and people can kind of choose which inter code interpretation to apply, then they're going to opt for the, for the version that doesn't require controlled receptacles. So by expanding the requirements, increasing the consistency across different applications, we would help to have more of these projects get implemented. Next slide, please. Um, and part of the problem is that controlled receptacles are not widely known or understood by the public uh, in general. According to our respondents, uh, if a building occupant knows about controlled receptacles, it's likely because of a negative experience they had with them. They're fairly uh, unobtrusive. So you might not know it's there until you plug in your phone and then the phone doesn't charge and now you're running to the airport with no battery. And that's how you remember controlled receptacles. So there is an opportunity here to educate not only building occupants, but those who are in a position to troubleshoot the technology and to demonstrate the positive attributes, not just the negative ones. Next slide, please. Because respondents aren't convinced that the control receptacles are being used, most are not convinced that they are also cost effective. Um, but what about the studies, right? There, there are studies that show that controlled receptacles do reduce energy. Um, so what, why, what's the response to that? And most of the response aren't confident in those either. Part of the reason is because uh, they don't know about the more recent, more rigorous studies that are available. But I think for the most part, it's because the studies, many of the studies are based on outdated information about what's being plugged in. Most of our plug load surveys tell us how much energy plugs are using, but they can't tell us what technology people are actually using them for. That means that we really don't know how much plug load energy is actually controllable. And even if we did, most of the surveys are over 10 years old and technology and work habits have, have changed a lot in that time. Uh, for example, even before COVID-19, most people have started, or not most people, but many people have started working from home um, or from co-working spaces that are available 24 seven. Um, most of us are probably using laptops rather than desktops at this point. And those laptops probably have sleep modes built in. So all of those components can impact how much energy control receptacles can save. And so until we have that updated information, it's really difficult for us to say with confidence where the savings are coming from. Next slide, please. So this uncertainty around savings leads to a lack of perceived value in the technology. And uh, the, I think the big takeaway I have is that it's not the cost, it's not the technical feasibility, those aren't barriers to code adoption. It really is the fact that it's hard to demonstrate the savings, and we don't know if anyone is actually using the technology. Next slide, please. So we did have a lot of speculation about how and if anyone was using controlled receptacles once they'd been installed. Um, but none of it was really based on personal observation. So it was, all, it was all speculative, reasonable, but speculative. I do have one piece of qualitative information to share that I think is interesting. Um, I spoke to a researcher at the California Plug Load Research Center at UC Irvine, and uh, they told me about a study that they did in a building that had control receptacles. Um, in the study, they were giving everyone these devices to plug in that were supposed to send information back to the researchers on Wi-Fi. Um, but they were finding that they were, they, they were getting these gaps in the data and they had to figure out why. So they sent the researchers back into the building to troubleshoot, and here's what they saw. We can move to the next slide. So they found that their devices, these Wi-Fi enabled devices, were being plugged into what they eventually discovered were controlled receptacles. And on these controlled receptacles, they were seeing different markings for different receptacles. And they just found it very difficult to get in any information about them. So here's three different types of control of receptacles that they found um, with different markings, and they weren't sure how to interpret them. Um, and it was really difficult to Google this information and try to find out what was going on. And keeping in mind that these are plug load researchers who are struggling with the technology. So, in the end, we don't really know what the end user experience is when interacting with, with plug load receptacles or automatic controlled receptacles, but there does seem to be an opportunity for a gap between the technology's potential and its use. Next slide, please.
So what's next? What do we do with this information? Um, I think that if we want to address the barriers to the, to the technology and help, help it realize its savings potential, we can really help stakeholders feel more confident in the savings. Uh, we need to, in order to do that, we need to update plug load information and have information that distinguishes between controllable plug loads like desk lamps and AV equipment and non-controllable loads like safety and standby equipment. And we need opportunities like this webinar to broadcast and give visibility to unbiased studies, which do exist. Because right now, uh, most of the education actually falls to equipment manufacturers, which is seen as potentially self-serving. And finally, we need to work to understand the remaining, the remaining unknowns, um, especially around user experience, but also around contractor activity. Is there a disconnect between project design and construction? Are there barriers to, uh, to actually implementing what goes on to the design drawing? And then how do we close the gap between the intent of the encode and the reality on the building site? Next slide, please. So that's all for me. Thank you very much for your attention. And thank you to the Better Buildings Alliance for inviting us. If you're interested in reading more about the study, please visit title24stakeholders.com. The study is available there in the future code cycles page. Great. Thank you, Kelly, and thank you, Marissa, for that very informative presentation. Um, I think these presentations are great because they talk about, we've highlighted um, the current codes for um, controlled receptacles, and um, Kelly and Marissa just went over some strategies for making them work with the building occupants. And also, we've highlighted that there is a need for continued research in this area um, around savings um, to increase the so that people know what the savings will be for um, for pursuing controlled receptacles. So thank you very much for, to the presenters. Um, next slide. So now I'd like to go into the Q&A section. Um, we have some questions for both, um, for all three presenters today. Um, we am looking, I'm doing a quick time check and I'm seeing that it looks like um, well, we might have some time for some of the partners to kind of share out some of your progress with PPL controls or some of the goals for PPL controls. So I just want to say that I already have one volunteer. It's Lauren Fitch from Iron Mountain and CBRE. So we'll be calling on Lauren a little bit later after the Q&A section. Um, but now I'd like to go back to Harold and ask him a couple questions. We have a few here that we would like to hit. And the first question is, what 2021 IECC code to adopt the 12-inch rule? You know, codes learn from each other. And Ashery, having been the first in 2010 to put receptacle controls inside um, their inside their standard, allowed observation and also feedback on that. And so some of the learnings of that was, was uh, this concern over uh, uh, plug strips, uh, excessive use of plug strips or also extension cords that could be a safety uh, issue. And uh, in fact, receptacle controls has appeared in proposals, not just this code cycle, but two prior, at least two prior code cycles for the IECC. And a lot of the comments to that was this concern over safety. So um, out, out, of, out of a need for safety and uniformity of distribution of a controlled versus uncontrolled, that 12 inch rule was put into place uh, in order to resolve that. Great, thank you. I have another question um, for Harold. Is plug load control set up versus receptacle by receptacle? Is plug load control set up as a group control versus receptacle by receptacle? Um, well, I mean, it, it's set up for a, it's intended to be a space, um, for instance, if you have a classroom, all those receptacles would go on and off together. It wouldn't be necessarily receptacle by receptacle in terms of its actual control. Um, they would they would be group controlled inside that particular space. If you're looking at modular furniture inside of an open office, the, I think the general intent would be is that within a, a 5,000 square foot area or less, 
that all those receptacles would turn off together when it's detected that no one is inside that whole 5,000 square foot area. And therefore they would be, all those receptacles would be grouped together. It's not that every independent receptacle would be controlled individually by schedule or occupancy. So I hope I've answered and understood the question properly, but. Great, thank you. I think I put you on the spot. Okay, um, the next question is for um, Kelly and Marissa. Um, what are the next steps to overcome the barriers and increase adoption of the controlled receptacles energy efficiency? Well, I can start with one and then maybe Marissa can add a second. Um, I think that one of the biggest barriers to uh, increasing adoption is uh, lack of uh, case studies that show energy savings from those objective sources. Um, and uh, as Marissa pointed out in the next step, uh, if we can find or conduct some of those studies um, and then put them together and release them from a neutral source, such as events like today, I think that that would go a long way um, in educating audiences that want to use them uh, about what they can expect from results. So, um, Marissa, what else would you add for that? Yeah, I think that's absolutely true. And I think that the education needs to go beyond just individuals in the industry. Uh, the fact that the technology is not very visible makes it difficult to adopt. Um, so if, there was a, if, if more people knew about it and knew how to use it and, uh, and why it was there, uh, I think that would, that would definitely motivate more folks to uh, think of this as a, as a positive. The other thing that I think would, um, that is being addressed, and Harold talked a little bit about the fact that IECC is including controlled receptacle requirements in the next iteration of the code. So just increasing consistency across different jurisdictions, I think that uh, it makes it easier to comply and it also ensures that the technology isn't overlooked. I think I would also add to that as we saw all these different examples of how, um, although each company, of course, of course, should design and offer their offering to be appropriate for their brand, um, looking at the industry uh, and seeing if there could be some improvements on marking consistency as well as um, uh, occupant education. Like Harold showed that um, desk card that one might leave at a desk as a new person moves in. Um, and as Marissa mentioned, we've got a changing workplace where you're not always in the same place. So if you're going to a co-working space or you're hoteling within your own company satellite offices, making sure that users know what goes into what, um, that will also overcome occupant fears that if they use this device that something they rely on um, may be shut off unexpectedly. So um, at the user level, although we don't have a lot of information on occupants, uh, and how they use these, uh, that is one thing that all of the studies that we found that did have any evidence seem to point to. Um, Harold, do you have anything you'd like to add to this question? Well, you know, I, I've studied the history of this a little bit, uh, and maybe this is more a perspective than anything else, and, and that is that, you know, and when it was introduced by ASHRAE in 2010, and probably the first jurisdiction to adopt that would have been possibly 2012, is that it, it wasn't a known technology. It wasn't, you know, wasn't utilized very much in any space. It was unknown and it, and it, it appeared in a, in a code. Um, and so I don't know if you remember, I remember back in the early 90s when occupancy sensors or automatic lighting shutoff first came into play and Dilbert had cartoons of interns being hired to wave their hands to keep the lights on in spaces. Um, I think it's a familiarity with, with the usability, uh, with how it operates, um, and then it becomes more common, more commonplace for us. And we've seen the same cycle with uh, daylighting controls. Initially, very difficult to deploy in spaces. People were unaware of them, and, and over time, they've they've come to understand how they operate and that they can be effective. And, and I, so I think it's 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 an adoption process is what we're in right now. Great, thank you. Um, okay, I have another question. Um, what kind of response have you heard from building owners about automatic receptacle control requirements? How difficult are they to implement? 
Well, I mean, I, I think the study kind of talked to a little bit about that we have a lack of real understanding from building owners and, and building owners, it's, it's, I think from what I have understood and what I have heard from building owners that I have talked to or been involved with is it's, there's a broad spectrum, some that don't like it, uh, others that regardless of the code, they implement it because they know of the energy efficiency capability that it offers and they're able to work and educate their employees on how to utilize it and you know what how to plug in the proper thing to the proper outlet. So, I mean, I, I think there's a broad range of it. Um, I, I, I don't think they're that difficult to implement necessarily, largely because the controls for, our, for the most part can already come in and write in on the lighting control. It's just a matter of wiring to the receptacle and having the right upstream control for it. And there are multiple methods to be able to do it. But, you know, I'm an electrical engineer, and so we're used to solving electrical problems in, in commercial buildings. But that would be my perspective. They're not too difficult. The study didn't show that it was insurmountable difficulty. Harold, I'm going to add on to that. Um, we didn't get to speak to too many facilities managers, but we did talk to a couple of them. And those that we spoke to were responsible for a portfolio of buildings. And from that perspective, uh, they're in favor of controlled receptacles because they do they they believe that they uh, they get energy savings and that's a net benefit to the portfolio. Um, the couple of individuals that we talked to very briefly who manage a single building and so they're mostly concerned with maintenance and operations um, were less. Uh, were less fans or they just didn't feel like they understood the technology well enough. So I think there is, again, a disconnect between those of us who care about energy savings and those of us who uh, are just concerned with the running of the building. Um, I think that for those who are inter who are more concerned with operations and maintenance, their primary concerns are around safety and security and comfort for their occupants. And so the idea of something operating kind of invisibly without their knowledge, or at least the perception of that, um, I think they're they're naturally wary of it, and so I think there's a there's some there's still some education that needs to happen as you kind of trickle down from the portfolio level down to the individual building. Great, thank you. And I'm hoping that webinars like this do, do connect um, some of the things that the researchers and um, project product developers know with um, some of the needs of the building owners. So at this time, I'd like to turn it over to the next section, which would be member updates. And so um, next slide, Dina, please. Um, I would love to open up the mic to Lauren Fitch, um, who should be on from Iron Mountain and CBRE to provide um, some updates as to what she's doing in her building portfolio um, for plug load controls. Thank you, Kim. Can you hear me? Yes, thank you. Perfect. Hello, everyone. As Kim noted, my name is Lauren Fitch, and I'm an energy manager with CBRE on the Iron Mountain account. Iron Mountain has uh, over 1,400 facilities across the globe, and approximately 50% are in North America. Um, so through the energy program I, I help us, uh, support, uh, we have goals of reducing operating costs and helping Iron Mountain achieve their public environmental goals such as RE100 and the science-based target initiative. Um, specifically to help meet those goals, we've executed lighting upgrade programs and currently are in the process of rolling out um, an HVAC optimization program to replace inefficient units and install controls to better monitor consumption at the sites. Um, we truly see plug load management as the next frontier for our facilities and we can use plug load management and efficiency practices to continue to reduce and control our consumption at our sites. And so with that, we've uh, recently had a call with the NREL team and they've assisted in uh, with guiding us to informative resources that we could use as we kickstart our investigation with plug load management. And it's been um, extreme help to have them uh, on our side and on our team as we begin this investigation piece as the next program we'd like to see rolled out to the facility. So we are in the early stages of, of the investigation and um, analysis across the portfolio, but have found the resources that NREL team has shared with us as extremely beneficial and, and we will be 
working with them, providing updates as we continue our progress. So thank you. Great. Thank you, Laura, and thank you very much for, um, I guess, the shout out. I really appreciate it. Yes, and so like Lauren said, we're willing to talk to any building owners who are looking to start a plug load management strategy. Um, plug loads are a tricky thing. Um, building owners are a little bit further along with managing, say, their HVAC and their lighting, and plug loads are kind of, kind of a new thing. Um, and so we're all in this together. And so what I'm hoping to do is to have some of these to share, I'm, I'm glad that Lauren spoke up because I just wanted to point out that um, you might not be doing um, the plug load management just yet, but it might be in your mind. So let's talk about it now so that we can get the strategies set up um, that work well for you. Um, so I'm wondering if any, if there's any other um, building owners on the line that would like to take a risk and share some of the things that you've been working on. Um, over the past few year or month regarding plug loads. Okay, I don't have any other ones right now. I think I think there's a few other great questions that came in from the audience. So I would like to um, move back to some of the Q and A. Um, so let's see. Um, so this, I think I have room for addressing one more question. And this one is for Kelly and Marissa. Um, so looking for a response, let's see. Um, so looking for a response to the comment that most clients want to have confidence that we understand which designated loads are controlled to ensure a visibly significant reduction of load, especially by building and space function. Um, like most controlled technologies, m and is not the issue. It's upfront confidence in the outcomes. And what are the thoughts from the team? Kelly or Marissa? I think we are each waiting for the other to address this one. I also think that Harold might have some input as well. Um, so considering this question, the, the tough words there are ensure a visibly significant reduction of load. Um, if I were uh, tackling this today, I would probably, as a codes and standards person, go back to some of the uh, case research or some of the research like we've heard about today and see if I were able to identify a building that were like mine. Um, it's, it's really difficult to ensure a visibly significant reduction without an additional layer of control on top of the plug loads as well. So if you don't have a building energy management system and you're relying at kind of, a, you know, looking at an aggregate to show that the system is working, that's tough. Um, so, um, I would probably go back and research through the case reports, but then I would also make sure that if I were planning something that I had the layers on top of it, that I would also maybe use to look at a reduction in lighting, lighting energy use through additional controls or HVAC use um, due to occupancy controls. So without that layer, you may not know. Um, but so I would look back at the past casework done through Title 24 Part 6 upgrades and past cycles, maybe going back to 2013, 2016. Uh, I would look to current casework um, that is informing the next iteration of the standards. And I would also go to the ASHRAE Lighting Subcommittee and ask what research was done with the controlled receptacle um, uh, uh, requirements when they were put into place there in the first place. Um, so that, that would be my quick off-the-cuff answer. Marissa and Harold, if you want to add to it, um, thank you. And I think we only, I, I, we're to wrap up, Marissa, so maybe some final thoughts. I was just going to uh, echo what Kelly said. I think that um, earlier, um, the, there are case reports that are available that apply to different types of buildings. So finding the case report that is most relevant to a client 
Um, and then I think I, I, to, to repeat what I said in the, in the presentation as well, having updated assumptions about plug load energy use would be uh, one step we could take to have a lot more confidence in our savings. Okay, great. Um, okay, so um, we're at the top of the hour, and I just want to say that if you have any additional questions, please email me um, at kim.trendbath at nvel.gov. Thank you for everyone um, on, on your attendance today. Thank you very much to our panelists of presenters. Um, information that you provided has been extremely helpful. This video is going to be recorded and provided to everyone for um, future viewing, um, and it'll be available on the PPL website. So hope everyone stays safe and have a wonderful rest of the week. Thanks all.